2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This is our text this morning. This is the fourth of five messages through the book of 2 Thessalonians. And if you pick up a Bible from the back table or the side table over here, you'll find 2 Thessalonians on page 990. So would you one more time stand with me and hear the reading of the first five verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you're doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Would you remain standing as we pray once more? Father, help us now. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Honor your Son and edify your people. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. If you ever listen or read someone giving advice about uh, tips for good writing, then you'll find a number of different elements. No doubt each individual thinks that something uh, goes into good writing that, that maybe another individual will disagree with. But as you go across the spectrum, one thing that's amazing is it seems like everyone who gives advice on good writing always includes one element. And that one element is read good writing. Read those people who are writing well. Now, in one sense, that's a bit odd, isn't it? I mean, if, if, if the one thing that was in everyone's writing was, everyone's advice was something like, be active, use, use active verbs or something like this, then, then if you're doing the task, then you're writing. If you're using active verbs, you're writing. Or if you're using descriptive Im imagery, you're writing. But you could read a whole library full of books of good writing and never write. So in one sense, it may seem a bit odd that everyone seems to include this element. In another sense, I don't think it's odd at all. Because I think we all understand that some things are better caught than taught. And some things are better picked up from watching someone else do them than merely receiving instruction. And, and, and sometimes, I think it seems to be, there's no substitute for actually seeing someone who's doing this task well for seeing writing done well, for reading it, for being exposed to a good writer. This, I think, is the same kind of reality we see in gospel ministry. There's a reason why, historically, there have been apprentices for uh, pastoral ministry, so that you can actually watch the task and see the task, the task being modeled in pastoral ministry. The same thing in uh, the work of a mechanic or the work of a plumber, right? There's certain things that it seems that there's a little more demanded than just an instruction manual, but actually see these things carry out and learn from them. When you get to the book of 2 Thessalonians, I think perhaps, unlike many other letters that Paul has, this one seems to be more autobiographical in nature. To compare it, for example, to the book of Romans. You read through the book of Romans, the first eight chapters of the book, there's theological lesson after lesson after lesson given in that. But when you read through the book of Thessalonians, I think one of the things you'll notice is this autobiographical nature. Paul refers much to his life with them. When I, when I came to you, the gospel came to you in this way. When I could stand it no longer, I, I sent Timothy to find out how you were doing or the like, right? It, it includes so much of who Paul is and, and what he's doing with the Thessalonians that I think this book really shapes up to serve in some ways as a model for ministry. We get to look at Paul and see what Paul is doing. And, and in a sense, Paul then serves as an apprentice for us. We see what his motivations are, what his priorities are, what his passions are, how he goes about things, what things he prays for, what things he wants them to pray for, and the like. And so because the book is written that way, this morning as we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, what, I, what I want to hold up for us is very much like I held up for us the last time we looked at this book. Namely, just a model for ministry, for gospel ministry, for fulfilling the Great Commission. How is it that we go about the task of making disciples of all the nations? 
Well, let's look at these five verses and see if we can learn from Paul some lessons, I think, as he models for us gospel ministry. And the first element I want to note is this. We must make the advancement of the gospel a priority. We must make the advancement of the gospel a priority. Now, I'm not going to say this too much from behind the pulpit, but please excuse me on this one occasion. Don't look at your Bibles for a second. Typically, don't join churches when they tell you not to look at your Bibles. But on this one occasion, just don't look at your Bible for a second. This will just be an exercise. Now, I might have ruined it because we've already you've read the text. You may have been studying it this week. You may have the text memorized, have it in your head. But what happens in 2 Thessalonians 3 is after ending chapter 2 with Paul praying for the Thessalonians, he switches in chapter 3 to say, Finally, brothers, pray for us. Now, just... Guess in your own minds for a second. What is it that Paul asks them to pray for? And you and I have conversations like this, don't we? How can I be praying for you? How can you be praying for me? So we may have met, had coffee, and, and I say, uh, you know, how can I be praying for you? And you list some things, and then you ask me the same question. And we answer those questions all the time, don't we, in ca casual conversations. Oh, how can you be praying for me? Well, yeah, well, when you pray for me, pray for this or that or the other. Perhaps it's easier than, than guessing what Paul asked for. It's just ask what we would ask for. What kind of things characterize our request when we say what Paul says here, finally, brothers, pray for us? I mean, this does reveal a bit of our priorities, doesn't it? The kind of things we no doubt ask prayer for, the kind of things we treasure, the kind of things we prize. Perhaps most of the time it would be, I'm just guessing, if I took a poll, health, finances, Job opportunity? Maybe the well-being or success of our children? Okay, now look back at your Bibles and see what Paul says. Finally, brothers, pray for us. This is his personal request. That the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. Do you see Paul's personal prayer request for himself, for his companions, is not for health, not for safety and travel, not for, uh, you know, kind of prosperity in his own life or something like this. His prayer request is for the advance of the gospel. Just, just turn back a few pages. Remember in 1 Thessalonians how Paul says the gospel came to Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So when Paul came to the Thessalonians, he preached the gospel to them and he said, I knew that you were chosen by God because when you heard the gospel preach, you received it as it was in the spirit of full conviction. You knew it was the power of God to salvation. You believed your lives were transformed. Well, now he's saying, if you want to know how to pray for me, you want to know how to pray for me and my companions, here's what you need to pray for us. Pray that the gospel may speed ahead and that it may be honored just as happened among you. That is, pray that we would get to witness the very thing we witnessed with you, that, that, that when you heard the word, you received it as the power of God. We pray that that would happen again and again and again. Even the latter part of his request in verse 2, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. I think that's simply the same thing. It, it, Paul, this is not Paul saying, and I, I just would like to avoid wicked and evil men who may be harm to me. No doubt he wants that, but I think that's simply a means for the gospel to be advanced. That he says, pray that this is not hindered. Pray that wicked and evil men who persecute the church, who hate the gospel, who want to see it stopped, pray that they do not thwart our efforts. Pray that, 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 that we are not hindered by them. Pray that we are delivered from them. Now, why is it that Paul can ask for a personal prayer request, right? This is for us. And make it for the speeding ahead and the honoring of the gospel. And I think really the only answer is this. Paul prays personally in his life and requests personally for him that the gospel would be advanced because it's what he most treasures. <clears throat> you see, this isn't a one-off for Paul. Remember the book of Philippians? Paul's writing to the Philippians from prison. 
And I don't think there's been a time in the history of the world or a culture where being in prison is a nice and easy thing. Perhaps, perhaps maybe rare occasions, but I'm just going to guess being in Roman imprisonment in the first century was not a good thing. And what Paul says to the Philippians is, I want you to know that my imprisonment... Here's what he writes in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Paul's response, therefore, isn't, therefore, though I hate where I am, I, I guess it's okay. No, he says in this, I will rejoice. This is Paul's passion. He wants to see the gospel advanced. If you gave him the option, Paul, you can stay out of prison and the gospel won't be advanced, or you can be imprisoned and the gospel will advance, his answer would be, give me prison and give me the gospel advancing. Because that's his passion. It's what drives him. I think it's then a chance for us to evaluate ourselves, isn't it? I mean, is this our heartbeat at all? Do we long to see the gospel advanced? Even when we see a video like we saw of the O'Days going to Salt Lake City, it, in our hearts does, does just rise up within us, this drive and desire, yes, Lord, let the gospel be received, let it be advanced. If not, maybe the nature of our personal prayer requests need to be something like this. Pray for me that I would love the gospel as much as Paul did. Or pray for me that I would love the gospel being advanced as much as Paul did. You see, Paul's an oppressive individual, but he doesn't have some kind of superhuman Christian powers. Paul's not, you know, super Christian. It's not as if the Lord's going, well, I understand, you can't be like Paul, you're nothing like him. No, there's nothing that keeps any of us from loving the advance of the gospel as much as Paul did. Except our own sin. Except that we treasure other things more, right? There's nothing. It keeps you and I from loving the advance of the gospel as much as Paul did. So perhaps we need to make it our prayer. God, help me to love the advance of the gospel like Paul. And perhaps as well, another weapon we can employ, just thinking about how Paul saw this happen among the Thessalonians, saw the transformation in their hearts, and it drove him to want to see the gospel advance more that it may speed ahead and be honored as happened among them. Maybe we need to notice more the transforming grace in people's lives. Maybe the more we notice that, the more it will drive us to want to see that happen more and more and more. Even this week, I, I was thinking about um, individuals in my life and just hearing posts on Facebook or the like, things where individuals who I once knew as unbelievers and are now speaking of their love for Jesus Christ. Stop and notice that. Right? Let that affect you. And then desire to see that happen more and more and more. What if the, the lost individual you have in your mind today, it's not impossible that somewhere down the road they could be posting on Facebook their love for Jesus Christ. Not because of your wisdom or your power, but because of the power of the gospel. This is why. Because Paul loves that idea. Because he loves how that honors the Lord. His personal prayer request is the advancement of the gospel. So, in gospel ministry, which is what all of us labor in as a church in fulfilling the Great Commission, the first thing I want to note is that we must make the advancement of the gospel a priority. Number two, we must trust in the Lord for the preservation of our souls. We must trust in the Lord for the preservation of our souls. Now, it may seem weird to you that Paul ends verse 2 describing these wicked and evil men by, by making this sentence at the end of verse 2, for not all have faith. It seems to be a bit of an understatement, right, or an obvious point. I mean, the Thessalonians are being persecuted for their faith by unbelievers. If anyone knows there are some people who don't believe in the world, the Thessalonians would have known that. So why does Paul describe these wicked and evil men by saying, yeah, Thessalonians, for not all have faith. Oh, not, not everybody believes the gospel. Well, of course they would know that. I think he probably does it for a couple of reasons. One, it serves as a contrast to what comes before. That is, in verse 1, when Paul prays that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, what he means is that it will be received in faith. That's then a contrast to those who do not have faith. 
But also what he's doing is he's setting it up as a contrast for what follows. After, at the end of verse 2, for not all have faith, he says in verse 3, but the Lord is faithful, and he will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Now, there are great translations of the Bible, so I don't want you in any way to think that, um, you know, if, if we don't know Greek, there's, there's no way we can understand the text. But I do think this, this contrast comes through a bit better uh, in the original language. Verse 2 actually ends with the word faith, pistis. And verse 3 begins with the word faithful, pistos. So if you're reading it, you just see the contrast immediately. Pistis, pistos. Faith, faithful. No, no, I have faith. Faithful is the Lord. What Paul's doing here is he's contrasting. There are many in the world who do not have faith and are hostile to the Lord. But God, on the other hand, is faithful. Do you see the mention of these wicked and evil men? It could have conjured up fear in the Thessalonians. I mean, Paul's asking them, pray for us that we would be delivered from wicked and evil men. The Thessalonians could think, well, we're not being. What about us, Paul? We're being persecuted. We're, we're being uh, tormented. We're suffering by the hands of wicked and evil men. Are we not being delivered? Of course, Paul's answer to them is verse 3, no. The Lord is establishing you and guarding you against the evil one. Yes, you may be suffering at the hands of wicked and evil men, but they can do nothing to pluck you out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how this point was made in the book of Revelation? In the book of Revelation, a people, churches in the midst of suffering, the Lord had an angel come down and mark a seal on the forehead of all of His people, showing you will suffer, but you're sealed. You're mine. Nothing can touch you. So I think if, if there's fear rising up to the Thessalonians, Paul immediately, after mentioning wicked and evil men, mentions the Lord's faithful. He's going to establish you and He's going to guard you. He will not allow His chosen ones to make shipwreck of their faith. That's the point. But there's also something else this does. It not only comforts us to know this, I think it enables us to live life like Paul did. It enables us to take risk. If you have young kids, you may have played out this drama at the swimming pool. It's happened in the Tankersley home. Everybody has their parts. A young child is supposed to stand on the side of the pool and not want to jump into the pool. The dad is standing in the pool pleading for the child to jump in the pool. And the mom sitting beside the pool saying, maybe the child's not ready yet to jump into the pool. And, and so this plays out, right? You know, I've, known, I've been there with Nick most recently, and I'm in the pool, and he's on the side, and I'm saying, hey, buddy, jump to me, and I'll catch you. And he says, I don't want to. No, jump to me, and I'll catch you. I'm scared. Jump to me, and I'll catch you. Move closer. You know, jump to me, and I'll catch you. Whatever, right? All kinds of... And so after a while, right, Lily's supposed to say something like, you know, maybe we should wait till next year. Maybe he's not ready yet. Maybe whatever. And I say, no, 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 no. We've got to do this. It's like a passage, right? And so I plead and plead and plead and plead, and finally he jumps, and Lord willing, I catch him. <laughs> and, we, and we all know why we go through that, right? Why is it that I'm giving my son in that moment, why is it that I'm giving him comfort after comfort after comfort? You're going to be okay. You're not going to be harmed. I'm going to catch you. It's because I want him to be willing to take a risk. I want him to be willing to run at something that he feels is dangerous. I think that's the function of verse 3. The Lord will establish you. He will guard you against the evil one. Therefore, it's okay. Run into a hostile world. Take the gospel into dangerous settings where there are wicked and evil men who hate you. Go into a world that is nothing less than enemy-occupied territory. As Aaron said last week, where we have Satan being called the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of this age, and the god of this world. Go into that world where Satan hates you, where sinners often hate you and hate your Lord, where Jesus Christ Himself said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. If they hate me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you, Jesus says. And Paul reminds the Thessalonians, the very one who is, who is longing to go into this hostile world and see the gospel advance. 
I think he's holding up for them. You know what? There's nothing that keeps you from risky, dangerous gospel ministry because he has established you and he'll guard you against the evil one. It's okay. It's okay to risk danger and hardship for the sake of the gospel. It's okay to do what the O'Days are going to do. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Will, will, will their lives be harder? I'm going to guess it will be. Will they encounter people who may even try to harm them? Perhaps. But it's okay. It's okay. If you want to go with them, it's okay. Because even if the worst happens, no one can pluck you out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has established you. We trust in the Lord for the preservation of our souls. And that frees us up for risky gospel obedience. Number three. We must let our trust in the Lord lead us to anticipate God's grace in others. I know that's a long point and perhaps needs explanation, so I'll say it again and then try to explain it. We must let our trust in the Lord lead us to anticipate God's grace in others. Now let me explain to you what I mean by that. Throughout the letter of Thessalonians, Paul has given commands to the Thessalonians, and he's going to give more commands to them. So what's Paul's mindset right now? Is he thinking to himself, you know what, this is not getting me anywhere. One of my favorite letters of Martin Luther is when he writes Philip Melanchthon, and he writes him this really long letter telling him, you know, to, to stop having a pity party, you know, just trust the Lord. And uh, at the end of it, he, he writes, uh, enough of this. After all, it's like pouring water into the ocean, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's just a waste of words. I know you're not going to respond. You know you're not going to respond. Why am I writing? He says, uh, you're sucking up my prayers like a leech, you know. Um, was this Paul's mindset, right? Is Paul th saying, this is now the second letter I've written. They're probably not going to obey. Well, well, no. Look what he says in verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. Paul's confident. They're going to do, they, they are doing, and they're going to do the things that he commands. Even those who are not currently doing what he commands, he has confidence they will do. And again, like his passion to see the gospel advance, this is not a one-off for Paul. Remember when he wrote to Philemon? about receiving back Onesimus. Here's what he writes in the 21st verse of the book of Philemon. Here's what Paul writes. He says he is confident. He writes to Philemon, I'm confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing you will do even more than I say. So he's treating Thessalonians the same way he treated Philemon. I trust that you're going to do what I tell you. You're going to do even more than I tell you. And this is not even just contained to Paul. Uh, the book of Hebrews. We, we know the book of Hebrews is giving warning passage after warning passage after warning passage, right? But if you read through the book, one of the things you'll notice is that the warning passages are consistently followed with confidence passages. Don't shrink back! But I'm confident that you will not shrink back. You know, don't go on deliberately sinning, yada, 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 but I'm confident that that's not who you are. You see... The, 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 the mindset, the nature of the biblical authors, and we'll take Paul here as our example, is that he has confidence. He trusts, he anticipates the grace of the Lord and other believers. Why was he confident in the Thessalonians? Why was he confident that the Philemon would do the right thing? Well, he says it there in verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord about you. His confidence is in the Lord about them. You see, I think that our response, our anticipation of how individuals should respond, perhaps that's a better way to say it, our anticipation of how individuals will respond in life may reflect more about our trust in the Lord than any other topic. Why? Because who are the Thessalonians? 
The Thessalonians, Paul's told us to this point, there are people who have been chosen by God, called by God, given faith, given repentance, made more like Jesus Christ, being preserved, giving works that they would walk in. They are the work of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's who they are. Why in the world then, if that's who they are, would Paul think, you know what? I don't think you'll respond in such a way that you show the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Why would he respond that way? That would show a lack of trust. Rather, his response is, I'm confident in the Lord that if he's done this, he's going to continue to work in you. But perhaps this is then a point for us to think about. I mean, how many times have you and I had a mindset that's completely contrary to this? How many times do we approach our brothers and sisters, or we think about our brothers and sisters, almost anticipating, I fully expect they're not going to do the right thing. I fully expect they, they won't respond the right way. Maybe you've gone into a meeting where, where you're going to have to confront somebody about the sin, and your whole response coming into that meeting is, I, I just bet money they're going to keep running towards sin. Why? Not only is that an uncharitable, unloving thought toward your brothers and sisters, but I think it reflects a lack of trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who if He has called them to Himself, no, that will work. Well, why is this element, anticipating God's grace in other people, why is that element crucial for us in gospel ministry? Here's the answer. Because gospel ministry is a church project. It's a community project. We labor together. Even as was prayed earlier in our service, when we send Timothy and Haley out, we are fellow workers with them. When we sent Andy and Laura to Botswana, we are fellow workers with them. And we could go on example after example after example. The work of the Great Commission is a task given to the church. It's only when every individual with which the Lord Jesus Christ has constructed this church is working properly that the whole body is built up in love. The work of gospel ministry requires the work of the church. Therefore, it requires us anticipating the grace of God in one another. It requires us loving each other as we would ourselves. If we don't think this way, and we give ourselves to backbiting, and we give ourselves to stirring up disunity, and we give ourselves to being isolated from others, we are grieving the Holy Spirit and not moving forward the work of the gospel. This is why this is crucial. Now, yes... Will we face disappointment in gospel ministry, even with each other? Yes, we will. There are going to be individuals in the church who, who profess faith and, 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 then, and then simply do not want to repent of their sin. We're going to face disappointment. But let it be that disappointment, not our met expectations. Let our view of one another be that we anticipate the grace of God in each other's lives. We pray for the advance of the gospel. We make it our priority. We trust in the Lord for the preservation of our souls. And we trust in the Lord so that we anticipate God's grace in one another's lives. And then finally, number four, we must fix our eyes on what the Lord has done for us in the gospel. We must fix our eyes on what the Lord has done for us in the gospel. In verse 5, Paul voices a prayer of blessing, a benediction for them. He says in verse 5, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Now, I think verse 5 is a long way of saying, May the Lord direct your hearts to the gospel. May the Lord direct your hearts to what the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father has done in redeeming you. And the reason I say that is because when we think of the love of God, how is it that the Bible tells us first and foremost to think about the love of God? How is that presented to us in the Bible? The love of God is presented to us in terms of God loved us in that while we were His enemies, He sent His Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Do you see that when we think of the God's love for us, we're first and foremost directed to God's love in sending His Son to redeem us. So when Paul says, 
May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God. No doubt, first and foremost, it's the love of God seen in the work of the gospel when Jesus Christ is sent from the Father to live, to die, and to be raised for us. Then take the second part of that, the steadfastness of Christ. Where do we see the steadfastness of Christ? Well, we see it in His earthly life as He persevered in obedience all the way to the point of death, right? book of uh, Philippians. He was obedient even to the point of death. He, he, he persevered. He was steadfast even in the garden when he could say, not my will, but yours be done. That was his steadfastness, his perseverance. So if the love of God is the love of God seen in the gospel and the steadfastness of Christ is the steadfastness of Christ seen in his gospel work of living and dying and being raised, then verse 5 is a way of telling us it's a way of praying for us that God might direct our hearts to be fixed on the gospel, particularly the work of the Father and the Son in the gospel. Now, yes, I do think that no doubt the reason Paul spells it out like this is because he does want us to see this as a model in, in a sense. Love as God has loved you. Be steadfastness in your life as Christ was steadfast. But I think it is more than that. I think this is Paul's way of saying, set your heart on the gospel. Do not lose sight of what has been done for you in the gospel. In fact, I'll say it this way. Perhaps the most important thing in gospel ministry is not to lose sight of what has been done for you in the gospel. If you lose sight of that, then after a while, you're going to be doing gospel ministry with a heart and an attitude that says, I'm trying to do enough so that God will be pleased with me and so that He will accept me and so that He will count me as righteous before Him. And if you go down that road, that road is a road of slavery and death. Because what you're going to realize is you can never do enough. And then when you become in, in, in yoked in slavery, a slavery of trying to do enough good, enough ministry or whatever the like, so that God will be pleased with you, when you become yoked as a, in a yoke of slavery, trying to do enough good to be justified, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to then be persecuting your brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because Paul said the children of the slave woman, that is the people who take on this yoke of slavery, of trying to do enough good, always persecute the children of the free woman. Meaning, if you're trying to be justified by your good works and you see someone over here who is resting in their justification by faith in the finished work of Christ alone, you're going to be persecuting them. Why? Because it's the only way you can get ahead. If you're trying to do enough to be justified, then the only way that you can find your heart any content is by looking at others and saying, well, at least I'm doing better than them. And so if they are doing well, you envy them. If they are doing well, you want to bring them down. You, you're like a man in an ocean who is drowning and the only thing you know to do is just to try to latch onto and drown those around you. That's the end of gospel ministry when it is done by someone who loses focus on the gospel themselves. This individual will isolate himself from other believers and ultimately work in destroying the church. This is how crucial this is. On the other hand, if you do ministry remembering what God and the Lord Jesus Christ have done for you in the gospel, then you will do ministry not trying to do enough to be accepted by God, but to realize you're already accepted through faith in the finished work of Christ. And now you do gospel ministry as someone who's already been justified, already been declared righteous, already stands before God knowing that He is pleased with you and accepts you. And in that way, if you have a heart that, that is free from condemnation, you, you know that you've been freed from condemnation because of the gospel, and you rest in that, that enables you then to love others. That enables you to just want to see others know the freedom of the gospel. It allows you not to be envious and tear down others, but to build them up because you're secure in the gospel. You don't, you don't mind if someone over here gets glory. They get praise. They get success. Because you have the acceptance of your God. The security that comes with recognizing what the Lord has done for us in the gospel actually frees us up to do the work of gospel ministry. It allows you to make your passion the advance of the gospel. It allows you, because you know that the Lord has already done everything for you to be righteous for Him, it allows you to trust Him 
for the preservation of your souls. It allows you to look on other people and anticipate and God's grace in their lives and love them because you know what he's done for you. This is why Jesus gave us this meal. He didn't give us this meal just so that we would have something else to do as we gather for worship. He gave us this meal so that verse 5 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 might be fulfilled. This is one answer to Paul's prayer. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, may the Lord, and I think this is here in the text, the Lord Jesus Christ, may the Lord direct our hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Jesus in part answered Paul, Paul, I'm answering your prayer. That's why I gave this meal. So that Sunday after Sunday we can come and have our hearts directed to the reality that God has loved us enough that He sent His Son. That Jesus Christ was steadfast and He obeyed even to the point of death for us. This morning we take this meal remembering that everything necessary for our salvation has been done. Remembering that we're right before God simply because of our faith in the finished work of Christ. If you're not a believer this morning, we would ask that you not take of this meal. But we would ask that you do something else. If you're not a believer this morning, please place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Stop trying to be good enough. Stop trying to avoid enough bad. And realize you can't do enough good and you can't avoid enough bad. But Jesus Christ has done enough for you. And trust in Him. If you'd like to talk to me or someone else after the service, we'd love to talk to you. If you are a believer this morning, you're in good standing membership of a gospel preaching church, then we want to invite you to join us at this table. We're going to take a moment of silence while the ushers come forward and the musicians get in their place. And during this moment of silence, maybe this is a chance for you to pray, God, give me a heart that loves the advance of the gospel like Paul did. Maybe it's a chance for you to say, God, help me to trust your preserving grace and take risks of obedience. Maybe it's our chance to repent because we haven't anticipated the grace in each other's lives or, or a chance to say, God, help me to do that more. Maybe it's simply a chance to fix our hearts on the gospel. But in this moment of silence, use it to respond to the word and then we'll gather at the table, singing together of the great love of our God for us. Let's take a moment of silence now as we prepare to come to the table.